Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Lavonis. With me today is my colleague, Dr. Sahafum Sursuma, and behind the cameras, uh, uh, Dr. James Cow. Uh, welcome on behalf of the Rocky Mountain Poison and Drug Center and the Rocky Mountain Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit. Uh, we're here to speak with you today about lead poisoning. The target audience for today's talk are physicians and advanced care practitioners, pharmacists, and public health professionals who are called on to assess and treat patients with possible uh, lead poisoning and lead exposures. Uh, at the conclusion of uh, this presentation, uh, we hope that you will be able to describe common sources of lead that are responsible for lead poisoning, describe the pathophysiology of lead poisoning, and common diagnostic and therapeutic approaches used to manage lead poisoning. Uh, this presentation was prepared on behalf of the American College of Medical Toxicology and funded um, from the CDC's Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registries, and there are some disclaimers noted here. So for the outline, we're going to talk about the overview of the late poisoning, pathophysiology, clinical manifestation, investigation, screening, and follow-up, and the treatment. For history, the Greek physician uh, from century before Christ observed the adverse of cognitive effects from infant whom of the lead smelters. Benjamin Franklin also observed the dry grips or abdominal colic and dangles or the clinical of wrist drop that affect the thinker, painter, and typesetter. In 20th century, there's high rate of stillbirth and infertilities and abortion among the women in the pottery industry or the women who were married uh, with the pottery workers. So lead is still common in our environment. Uh, the most common uh, situations in which people are exposed to lead is when they are repairing uh, specific parts of automobiles, particularly ra uh, radiators, and reclaiming lead from lead batteries in cars. Um, leaded fuels are still used some in the United States, though much less than they used to be. Uh, there's leaded crystal and glass and ceramic glazes. Uh, lead smelters and refiners, any place where lead is heated is a potential source of lead exposure to the workers and to the people around them. Uh, this includes mining and metallurgy. Um, and metal welders and cutters can be exposed to lead. Lead is present in older paints, and sometimes we, pa we see patients exposed to, lanes, exposed to lead from paint, either when the paint breaks down into dust and flakes that people eat or inhale, or when people are remodeling and they're heating and scraping old paint to get it off. Uh, ship breakers, that is people who take old ships and break them down into component parts for recycling, uh, are often exposed to lead from welding, electronics, and um, paints from old ships. Um, battery uh, recycling and reuse is a very dangerous industry for lead poisoning. Uh, lead is of course present in bullets. Um, people with retained bullets can sometimes develop lead poisoning as they absorb lead from the bullet. Also people who reload and people who uh, spend a lot of time, typically workers on indoor firing ranges. Uh, lead is used in the manufacture of PVC pipes, though the pipes once they are manufactured aren't really a danger. Uh, again, miners. And uh, we see uh, lead come in in herbal medications, spices imported from other countries, and cosmetics from other countries. For pharmacokinetic, for the absorption is higher in children more than adults, about three times. The main route of absorption is pulmonary. It's about nearly 100% in kids, whereas it's about 30% in adults. The oral absorption in kids is about 40 to 50%, whereas the oral absorption in adults is about 10 to 15%. The oral absorption is going to be higher in calcium, iron, or zinc deficiency people. The distribution of lead is going to be go to the bone. So the kid have less bone mass, so 70% of total body burden is going to be go into the bone. Whereas adult have more bone, so 95% of lead burden is going to adult bone. It means that there's also uh, free lead circulating or go to the vital organ more in kids than adults. The major route of excretion is in urine. Lead can also cross the placentas. For pathophysiology, uh, lead from complex with several ligand, especially the sulfhydryl group, which is in the proteins. The, and protein is act as enzyme, receptor, and structural. 
is also interfere with calcium and zinc mediated metabolic pathway. So it's important to remember that lead, unlike say copper or iron, uh, does not have any um, uh, healthy role in the body. Any amount of lead uh, poisoning can produce toxicity, and this toxicity affects many organ systems in the body. Uh, the primary toxicity that we see is neurologic, uh, but there are also important um, uh, injuries that can occur uh, to the hematologic system, to the kidneys, and to other systems as we're about to describe. So the most um, significant toxicity that we generally see from lead poisoning is uh, to the brain um, and also to the peripheral nerves. With acute exposure, um, such as high dose exposure from uh, smelting or uh, heating lead uh, or high dose ingestion of paint chips, say in a small child, uh, the most feared complication is lead encephalopathy. Uh, this causes all the symptoms you'd expect of encephalopathy with altered mental status, increased intracranial pressure. Uh, this can be a fatal condition. Chronic neurotoxicity from lead exposure is more insidious, um, but also very dangerous. Um, some patients will have headaches and changes in behavior. Um, uh, there's a very strong dose-dependent association between chronic lead exposure and lowered IQ, particularly in children, and unfortunately these effects uh, are thought to be irreversible. Um, lead is also a motor neuron toxin. So it causes a peripheral uh, neuropathy that's a pure motor neuropathy, typically affecting the extensor uh, muscles in the wrists and the feet. So you see foot drop and uh, wrist drop, such as this patient he has here. You can also see in this picture a lot of muscular atrophy in the hands uh, because of the denervation affecting the nerves feeding those muscles. Uh, on average, um, a child exposed to lead chronically in childhood will have a 4.6 uh, point drop in IQ for every 10 micrograms per deciliter increase in blood lab level. So that is a substantial amount. Um, some children uh, with lead levels even in the detectable to up to 10 range can have a loss of IQ of about 7 points compared to their non-exposed peer. For hematologic manifestation in acute form, lead can cause hemolysis. In chronic form, it can inhibit heme synthesis, impact retrocyte membrane stability and cause basophilic stippling. This is the heme synthesis pathway. The red, the enzyme that uh, in the red box, delta aminobulonic acid and ferrochelatase is the enzyme that were inhibit by lead. And the enzyme delta aminobulonic acid dehydratase and activity can be sent to see if the lead uh, inhibit this enzyme or not. There are also a lot of byproducts uh, accumulate in lead poisoning patients, including uh, protoporphyrin in red blood cell, delta aminobulinic acid, propo, pro, sorry, porphobilinogen and copoporphyrinogen 3 that excrete in the urine. That can be sent as well. This is the picture of the basophilic stippling in red blood cell. You can see that the red blood cell have the blue dot uh, in it. The basophilic stippling is the degrade DNA that usually uh, be lysed by enzyme called pyrimidine 5 nucleotidase, but lead also inhibit this enzyme that cause the degrade RNA still uh, in the red blood cell and see as the basophilic stippling. Basophilic stippling uh, can see in other conditions as well, but it's going to help on the diagnosis. Besides lead poisoning, it can also be seen in arsenic poisoning, hemoglobinopathies, pyrimidine 5 nucleotidase deficiency, G6PD deficiency, megaloblastic anemia, and alcoholism. For renal manifestation in acute form, it can cause, cause lead nephropathy in form of Fanconi-like syndrome. The patient is going to have amino acid urea, glucose urea, and phosphorurea. In renal biopsy, you can see the nuclear inclusion body in renal tubular cells. These findings are reversible if the patient was treated and uh, stopped the exposure. In chronic form, lead can cause the progressive interstitial fibrosis and impair uric acid excretion and cause patient to have gouty attack called saturine gout. For musculoskeletal, lead also inhibit bone growth at the metaphysis and also interfere with the calcium deposition. So the, cal the bone at the metaphysis did not grow and calcium get in more. So you can see the uh, ra radiopaque at the metaphysis 
from the calcium deposition called lead line. This can be found in kids and teenagers. And if it accumulates much enough, the kids gonna have the problem with the bone growth and also short stature. The other symptoms are include hypertension, reproductive impairment, infertilities, endocrinopathies. Another most common one is the GI symptom, the spasmodic abdominal pain and constipation is most common symptom that can found in occupational finding. Another mucocutaneous uh, manifestation is Jing Ji Wao lead line or called burden line, is, which is the uh, darkening line on the gum. Uh, the carcinogenic effects is a uh, report in animal study only in rat but no report in human. This is the blood lead concentration in adult and kids and the manifestation. You can see that uh, kids tend to have more symptoms in the same level as the adult. As you can see that uh, the kids tend to have encephalopathy at the level about 7 microgram per deciliter, whereas adults gonna have encephalopathy at the concentration around 100 microgram per deciliter. So you're probably wondering, what do I do when I have a patient with an elevated blood lead level or when I'm suspecting lead poisoning? So the workup for lead poisoning is really uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, it starts with some things you can get simply, a CBC and a peripheral blood smear to look for basophilic stippling, as my colleague described. Um, x-rays can be helpful. Um, uh, uh, abdominal x-rays may find paint chips uh, ingested by a child. Uh, long bone films um, can show lead lines. Um, again, this is mostly uh, something you do in children. Um, uh, chest x-rays are, sorry, chest x-rays are sometimes helpful. And if there is a retained bullet, an x-ray can show if that lead is being absorbed um, into the system. Lead, uh, uh, bullet fragments that are embedded in solid bone or that are in uh, soft tissue such as muscle generally will not leach significant amounts of lead. Uh, but lead foreign bodies that are in contact with moving bone that's under motion or in disc spaces that are bathed in fluid such as uh, in joint space or, spinal or the spinal canal can leach significant amounts of fluid. An x-ray will show you whether that lead is staying in put or being mobilized. Uh, nerve conduction studies are also helpful to diagnose uh, neuropathy as opposed to other potential causes of uh, nerve uh, pathology. Um, the linchpin of diagnosis is the whole blood lead concentration. This is done on a venous sample. Um, there are special lead certified needles or heavy metal certified needles and tubes that should be used, although that's rarely a problem in labs today. Um, those concentrations are almost always send out labs and depending on your send out lab situation will take anywhere from three days to two weeks to come back. Um, tests that can be done quickly, um, sometimes even with portable equipment, uh, but that are not as useful are zinc protoporphyrin levels in red blood cells, uh, ALA dehydratase uh, activity in whole blood. Um, those can sometimes be used uh, to um, provisionally rule in or rule out lead poisoning with a differential diagnosis is in doubt. And they actually still have roles in some of the OSHA requirement management for uh, lead poisoning. Although generally speaking, if you have a blood lead, these other um, levels really aren't very helpful. Um, if the question has to do with the whole body uh, lead burden, there's a technique called K X-ray fluorescence, which can be used to measure the amount of lead in bone in a living person without uh, injuring or requiring a biopsy. For periodic screening and follow-up, American Academy of Pediatrician and Center of Disease Control and Prevention recommend screening in all children aged at 1 and 2 years old. And also recommend for the kids that old, older than that and never been screened before. Some local health departments such as in New York, Chicago and Philadelphia recommend screening every 6 months from age six months old to two years old. When, you, when the screening come back, if the level less or equal to nine, you, uh, the kid's gonna be retest for another year. If the level 10 to 14, retest at three months and give the educational. At concentration of 15 to 19, retest at two months, give the education and refer the case for the management. The concentration at more than 20, but less than uh, 44, 
uh, have the clinical evaluation, give the education, and do the environmental investigation. No chelation at this point. The chelation gonna uh, have the role when the concentration equal or more than 45. And if the con concentration more than or equal to 70, you need to hospitalize the children and give the immediate chelation therapies. In 2012, uh, the CDC changed the action number to five. So the concentration more than five, you start to uh, do the clinical evaluation and give the education. Now, as uh, Dr. Sasuma explained, um, children are more sensitive to lead poisoning than adults, and uh, adults often can tolerate uh, blood lead levels uh, that would put a child in the hospital, uh, sometimes can produce very mild symptoms in adults. Uh, the OSHA standards vary a bit uh, depending on whether it's general industry or marine industry or some others, um, but the general industry standard, which is what applies to most workers, um, requires um, blood lead, periodic blood lead testing in workers who work uh, with or around lead. Um, if the blood lead level is over 40, the worker has to be notified. If it's over 50 on, three, on the average of three tests or over 60 once, the worker has to be removed from the job until the blood lead level has been measured less than 40 twice. Um, treatment standards for adults are much more liberal than for children. Uh, generally, we will um, chelate uh, symptomatic adults uh, or asymptomatic adults with very high levels, but most of the time for adults, um, the exposures are more chronic and um, removal of exposure is the key. For treatment in acute toxicity, mainly first do the primary survey and stabilize the station. Give the supportive treatment if the patient sees or agitate, give the sedation and maintain the urine output because it, it is the main route that you excrete the lead out of your bodies. For decontamination, the gastric lavage may consider if the patient just ingests uh, lead within like first hour. For the activated charcoal, lead did not bind to the activated charcoal, so it's no benefit to give it at all. For whole bowel irrigation, it have a role to do the whole bowel irrigation if you detect the radio-opaque material on the abdominal x-ray, such as the uh, late pain chips. And the specific treatment is the chelation therapy that we're going to talk about further. For chronic toxicity, the main uh, treatment is avoidant and stop the exposure. The chelation therapy do only in the case that have moderate to severe toxicity. In case that have Ion, calcium, zinc, and vitamin C deficiency. Uh, replace this nutritional supplement. Gonna decrease the lead absorption through the gut. In case that have retained bullets, do the surgical removal of the retained bullet. Gonna uh, stop the exposure. For chelation therapy, we have chelators such as dimercaprol or BAL. This is the IM drug. Uh, that dissolve in the peanut oil. So uh, before giving this, you need to check the uh, history of peanut allergies. The second drug is calcium disodium EDTA. This is the intravenous drug. The succimer and the penicillamine is the uh, oral drug. The chelation therapy in children, in children that have uh, encephalopathy or the level uh, more than 69, consider parenteral chelation regimen using combining BAL and calcium disodium EDTA. Asymptomatic kids with blood lead concentration 45 to 69, uh, consider using uh, succimer oral alone or calcium disodium EDTA IV alone. In asymptomatic kid with blood lead level less than 45, not recommend routine chelation at all, but you need to stop the exposure. For adults that have encephalopathies or blood lead concentration more than 100, also recommend parenteral combined chelation using BAL and calcium disodium EDTA. For my symptom that all have the blood lead concentration 70 to 100 using succimer 
alone or calcium desodium EDTA alone. In asymptomatic adult with blood lead concentration less than 70, no routine chelation recommend. Just stop the exposure. So um, treating lead poisoning it can be risky and expensive. Uh, prevention is the key. Um, so uh, the first thing to do if you have a child with a blood lead level um, over um, uh, the level of concern is to notify your local health department. Um, the health departments have educators who can do home inspections to look for sources of lead. It can also work with families to help them understand the types of things they can do to reduce the exposure for their children. Um, the most hazardous areas of a home are places where they are peeling or otherwise uh, degraded paint. Um, the most hazardous areas of the yard may be soil if you're in a high lead soil area. Uh, this starts with dust control, wet mopping areas frequently, uh, watching uh, children's hands and toys and pacifiers frequently. Uh, all children put things in their mouths all the time and you can't get that to zero but you want to reduce the amount of lead ingested as much as possible. Uh, soil lead exposure can be um, reduced by uh, planting uh, vegetation that reduces dust such as uh, grass and shrubs. Um, in some parts of the country, there is a significant amount of lead in tap water. Uh, so only cold and flood, cold tap water from uh, well flushed pipes should be used in these areas uh, because the stagnant water that's been sitting in pipes for a while has more lead in it. Um, optimizing nutrition, um, as Dr. Um, as Rasuma pointed out earlier, um, children who are iron deficient or zinc uh, or calcium deficient will absorb lead more avidly. And sometimes we'll put those children on multivitamin with iron supplements um, so that the body is not so avidly trying to absorb minerals uh, from the uh, diet and getting more lead as they're at it. Uh, avoid um, occupations that will lead to uh, lead exposure. So if you are a parent who reloads um, uh, uh, reloads projectiles or who shoots, you want to keep the children away from the areas where those hobbies are done. Um, and uh, to be very alert to other sources besides the obvious ones in the home. I've had patients exposed with uh, medications sent uh, by their family members from other countries or from cosmetics uh, that were purchased from other countries, occasionally herbs and spices from other countries. So all of these things matter. Our supply in the United States is generally quite safe, uh, but uh, it's a large world. Uh, in the workplace, um, patients or workers who are exposed to lead in the course of their jobs are required by OSHA to have lead exposure monitoring. Um, anything you can do to improve ventilation uh, will reduce the amount of lead that workers are exposed to. And personal hygiene habits really matter. And it's simple things like no smoking on the job site because hand to mouth behavior leads to a dramatic increase in the amount of lead dust uh, that is absorbed requiring people to wash their hands uh, before eating, drinking, or smoking to get dust off the hands again because that hand-to-mouth behavior is a source of lead exposure. Um, when lead is heated, regular dust masks won't be adequate and more formal respiratory apparatus is needed. And having people who are in heavy lead industries change from their work clothes and shower before leaving the work site uh, helps protect them personally and also their family from lead exposure. In pregnancy, case the lead can freely pass through the placenta and accumulate in the fetus. There's a case series and literature reviews of using the chelators. It's found that the chelators did not association with the birth defects. So you can uh, do the chelation to the pregnancy case. But the chelation have limit efficacy for the, fet for the fetus. So uh, treat, the, treat the mom and assess the fetus later. Lead can go to the breast milk and uh, me being the route of ex exposure in infant. So we recommend uh, check the lead concentration in milk and uh, stop breastfeeding until the, the lead is uh, de decreased in the milk. So uh, just to wrap things up, uh, lead is common in everyday life. It's a very uh, useful uh, mineral and still has its place in our society. Uh, the toxicity of lead is mainly uh, because it impairs the uh, function of certain enzymes uh, that use calcium and zinc in their pathways. Lead is a multi-organ toxin, but the most important toxicities are to the uh, brain, the peripheral nervous system, and the bloodstream. And the mainstay of treatment is prevention. And if prevention has failed, then removal from exposure along with chelation therapy. 
So thank you for spending your time with us. Again, on behalf of the Rocky Mountain Poison and Drug Center and the Pediatric Environmental Health and Specialty Unit, uh, Rocky Mountain, uh, thank you very much for your time and attention today.